Now this lecture is going to focus on thermal regulation and essentially how to keep your body um, at homeostasis during both hot and cold um, weather. Uh, Vegas is kind of interesting because generally it's hot, um, but through the Vegas Marathon it is very cold, so we'll talk about that a little later on as well. Um, it's important to understand uh, the environment which you are exercising as each environment provides different obstacles um, to your success through thermal regulation. Uh, just a little quick history. Um, D.B. Dill is one of the found, founding guys and, and most important researchers with respect to fatigue and thermal regulation um, with his work at the Harvard Fatigue Lab. Um, after his long and dust and illustrious career um, at the Army and University of Indiana, a little well-known fact is that D.B. Dill did move to Boulder City um, in Nevada here, where he became a research professor at the Desert Institute at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. So D.B. Dill does have a tie to UNLV, um, and his work continued to investigate uh, the physiological impact of heat stress here at UNLV through the Desert Institute. So why is thermal regulation so important? Well, the process of maintaining homeostasis is essential because the body's processes, both cellular and metabolic, are affected by the internal environment. So the goal of maintenance um, through regulation, through thermal regulation is a constant core temperature by preventing both overheating and overcooling. It's important uh, to note that in order to maintain the proper temperature, heat gain must balance heat transfer or heat loss and vice versa. You will also hear the term core temperature rather than body temperature, because the temperature is comprised of core and internal temperature and the skin temperature. So when I say body temp, I'm, I'm generally referring to a combination of core and skin. Um, if I'm more specific, then I'll say either core or skin temperature. Now for the human body to um, function properly, there's a narrow range of temperatures that it strives to be within. Um, if you go beyond these extremes, you can see um, by this slide some of the um, detrimental effects that these temperatures may have. You know, greater than 45 degrees Celsius, 113 degrees Fahrenheit, you destroy no more protein structures, resulting in cell death. Um, and as just as little as 95 degrees Fahrenheit, you have mental functioning impairment and blood muscle fails. So just take away from this that there is that narrow range that we like to be within. And anything outside that range causes some problems the functioning of our system. Now the maintenance of the internal homeostasis um, through thermal radiation is quite complex and is accomplished by the hypothalamus. Uh, this serves as an internal thermostat by initiating the correct temperature rate systems, heat production or rate of heat loss when the situation calls for it. Excuse me. The anterior hypothalamus is primarily responsible for dealing with increases in body temperature and the posterior hypothalamus is assigned when our body temperature decreases. So there are receptors from both the skin and the core, and these provide information regarding that temperature. When heat re decreases, when heat increases, the anterior hypothalamus responds by increasing cutaneous vasodilation and sweating. And then during instances of cold, the posterior hypothalamus responds by shivering cutaneous vasoconstriction stimulation of goosebumps, which improves the insulation space over the skin, and further influences of increased catecholamine and thyroxine chemical releases. So the body has both voluntary and involuntary mechanisms of heat production. Uh, the conversion of ATP into mechanical energy is an extremely inefficient process, with the majority of the energy produced lost as heat. Now, with two-thirds to three-quarters of the energy created loss as heat, the cost of exercising skeletal muscle um, energy creation is a high amount of heat. Um, here's a little graph that just shows the rate of energy utilization um, and sweat rate according to running speed. Um, you have the different a uh, athlete weights there or masses there as well. So this is just a little graph of a, of a cyclist, um, and you see all of the different heat loss mechanisms and mechanisms that are causing heat to go into the system during activity. Now, there are numerous mechanisms that are combined to affect 
the heat bounce within the system during activity. There are four major mechanisms through which the body controls heat loss, radiation, conduction, convection, and evaporation, and we'll get into each one of those individually here. So radiation is a loss of heat through infrared rays without physical contact. There's a great deal of radiation heat that is transferred to the human body in places like Las Vegas from the sun that reflects off both the ground, the buildings, um, the rocks, those sorts of things. Now radiation is said to account for up to about 60% of our heat loss at rest, but this percentage is reduced and minimized during exercise and activity. Now conduction is the transference from direct contact. So the molecules of hotter environment transfers to cooler environment. So this is what happens when your hand gets burned when you grab a hot environment, right? So your hand is much cooler than the hot pot or hot kettle. When you touch it, it transfers to your hand and burns you. Now convection is a process through which heat is transferred to the surrounding air or water that comes into contact with it. If the air or water passes over the body surface, it's cooler than the skin surface, then the air or water molecules are warmed, which removes heat from the body. This method depends upon the direction of fluid of movement, of fluid movement, and the speed at which it moves through the surface of the body. Now, this is an interesting concept. You know, I was just watching the Iron Man Kona this weekend, and during cycling and running, there are many trade winds. But so during cycling and running, it is possible for there to be a tailwind that removes this mechanism. If the wind and the athlete are traveling at the same speed, it can feel as though there is no wind, which removes this ability to cool through convection. Now, evaporation is going to be the most important mechanism for heat loss during activity. Evaporation occurs when heat is transferred to the skin in the form of water and sweat. Once sweat reaches the skin, it is converted into a watery gas vapor. Now, in order for skin or sweat to evaporate off the skin, there needs to exist a vapor pressure gradient. So that is a high to low pressure gradient. Uh, the vapor of the pressures of the skin must be greater than that of the surrounding environment. And this often is not the case in environmental conditions such as humidity, such as Kona this weekend. Sometimes it tends to be much more humid there than, than Las Vegas. So the effectiveness of evaporation as a cooling mechanism depends upon the ambient conditions, air temperature and humidity, the motion of the air around the body, and the amount of skin that is exposed to the environment. We'll talk a little bit more about evaporation here in, in a few minutes. So the fact is that with the increase in bucket lists running and number of races all around the world, all endurance athletes must take into account the environment they would that they plan on running, considering clothing and fluids and training. All environmental challenges, all environments have challenges and provide different precautionary rules. Whether you're gonna overheat, whether it's gonna to be too cool, whether while you're running, you can run into Speedo, but what happens is as soon as you stop running in these cold environments, you're gonna to need to put something on you because that's when hyperthermia will begin. So this is a little graph, um, the time of exercise and the energy flow. Um, so as you start to produce heat and what is um, involved in the heat reduction. Now keep in mind, this is um, if we were exercising at a submaxal pace or intensity in a cool environment for about 25 minutes and up to 50 minutes. So if the exercise took place in this cool or moderate temperature environment at submaxal constant loads, um, we can see um, the mechanisms through which heat production and loss would occur. So heat production increases as a result of working skeletal muscle, uh, and, the, and the roles of the heat loss are minimal, but constant for both convection and radiation. You can see that evaporation does take the majority of the um, workload um, for this heat loss mechanism um, throughout most, especially following that 15, 20 minute range. So the increase in temperature um, is a result of skeletal muscle contraction during activity as stated previously, and the increase is directly proportional to the intensity of the exercise. Now, the venous system plays an important role in regulation of the temperature. So, and how does this happen? Well, the venous system travels through and around the working skeletal muscles, 
with an increased flow diverting uh, the travel to non-working muscles and organs. The venous blood is heated and redistributed to other body, particularly the skin. Now, this is where our knowledge previously of, of what happens with endurance training comes into play, because remember, a benefit of endurance training is an increase in plasma volume. So this increase in plasma volume allows for greater removal of heat into the venous system uh, for transport to the skin. This mechanism allows for greater cooling, cooling capacity uh, through evaporation for trained athletes. So that is why trained athletes become more efficient at cooling their bodies. So there are numerous factors that affect heat balance during exercise, um, and here are a few of them, and we'll discuss each one of these individually. We begin by talking about exercise intensity, um, which is said to affect the amount of heat produced um, at a proportional value fashion. Uh, this is due to the body's ability to remove the heat through main mainly evaporation until the intensity level produces the amount of heat that is too great capacity of the blood to remove heat from the working skeletal muscle um, and through proper um, sweating mechanisms. Wind around the athlete provides convection uh, when the unwarmed air travels around the body and removes the heated molecules. If the air travels in the direction of the athlete in a fashion of tailwind, then the benefits of the wind through convection are removed, as we talked about before. Um, the twirling wind during the Kona Ironman race is a well-documented case of how the wind direction can affect how difficult um, a, articular, a particular leg of the race can be um, interpreted by the athlete. So athlete A may go through one portion of the segment and the wind is, is a headwind, so it feels great where, um, you know, they have to work a little harder, but it doesn't seem like they're working harder because of the reduced um, heat effect. Where uh, participant B goes through the same area, is working less hard, but their heat is um, not being cooled off, so it feels like they're doing much, much more work. Now, high environmental temperatures affect the ability to cool through convection. In these situations, evaporation is the only mechanism to lose heat. Now, the sweat must evaporate in order to have a cooling effect. So, just dripping sweat has zero cooling effect, causing humidity to be a tough environment to cool in. The challenge with low environmental temperatures is the body's ability to produce enough heat to keep the temperature up. This is where clothing is quite important to eliminate the loss of heat through convection. Oh, I wanted to tell you a little bit more about clothing. Um, one of my stories is, is Vegas Marathon, and, and, and we'll go back and talk about that probably a little later. Um, but one of my worst Vegas Marathons ever was because it was so cold that I almost got frostbite. Um, but the body has an amazing ability to adapt to training in the elements. Um, and heat acclimation begins immediately with your first training event in the elements. So the body is said to be fully acclimated to the heat between 7 and 14 days with the optimal method of training being around 50% of your VO2 max intensity. So it's a kind of a moderate to, to low intense exercise. Although the full acclimation occurs within the two weeks, um, there's said to be a continuing improvement for up to 30 days. So you can still gradually improve your ability to um, adapt and, and work better in that environment. But as you return to your normal environment, within one week, you'll be going right back to your body's normal processes and in, in, in ability to not be adapted to that. Um, some of the physiological changes seen are reduced heart rate, reduced body core temp, you reduce the sweat salt concentration because your body's trying to hold on to those more, and you reduce metabolic rate. Right. So there's a decreased rate of blood and muscle lactate accumulation and rate of carbohydrate utilization. This probably tends to be because you're working at a lower intensity level, right? Because you can see that all those right there, decreased rate of blood and muscle lactate accumulation and carbohydrate are all factors of your intensity level. There are also increases in sweat rate um, with an earlier onset of sweating, although that sweat does have a lower salt concentration. Now, the dehydration story is kind of uh, complex and, and it's rather interesting. And, and Noakes talks about this uh, very um, interesting study in um, 
Nevada here as far as DB, DB Dills Group. Um, and what this is, is in 93, the miners drank um, less than they sweat and urinated. So they were out in the mining fields in, in the heat of Nevada. Um, there was a progressive dehydration that occurred. And, and those that did not drink water found a premature fatigue that set in. Those that were able to um, continually drink as they were on or drink as they wanted to throughout did not see this premature fatigue. Now, it's generally stated um, that they're, they're, people tend to stop their exercising at 7 to 10 bot loss in body weight. Um, there's a rectal temperature and heart rate rise that is a linear, linearly associated with dehydration of about 0.2 to 0.3 degrees Celsius. Now, the problem with dehydration um, is that you don't really become thirsty until you're already about 2% um, body weight loss, right? Um, so if we're 2% already on the way to 7 10%, then we're kind of fi fighting an uphill. Um, but dehydration problems are there's a reduce in blo blood skin flow um, and the sweating response, which in turn is going to reduce our ability um, to fight heat illness or, or body loss, or body heat loss, right? So this Wyndham and all 96 or 69 um, they found that dehydration level was the most important mechanism of avoiding this heat-related illness. Um, and it's through some of these mechanisms, right? So reduced blow and sweating response. So your body is unable to um, eradicate the heat from itself through evaporation. Now, importantly, um, elite runners generally um, are finishing races with the 6 to 7% um, dehydration level. So they're on the border of these side effects. And some report that side effects aren't seen until about 15 to 20 percent level of dehydration um but so that's up for controversy but we'll see um now to bite the dehydration or to battle dehydration um the the way that you are ingesting fluids has been a very very intense um researched mechanism some go through this force where you need to take so much because you're losing so much in sweat that for every um, amount of milligrams or, or liters of sweat that you um, let go you need to take such and such liters of, of fluid in um, others say what well, no it's just ad libitum it's just whatever the subject needs to take and whenever they feel they need to take a drink they should take a drink um, and and right now the science is leaning towards ad libitum um, and that's because of some people have different abilities to um, withstand fluids in their stomach during activity. And depending on the activity level, if I'm running or if I'm cycling, it's a much different ad libitum value because runners, remember, you're bouncing up and down. That sloshing is going back into your system. Um, and it's not as easy to take fluids in. Where cycling, it's much easier to take your fluids in and you're sitting down. So in a, in a triathlon, they're saying, you know, you probably going to spend a lot more time um, and energy drinking and, and ingesting your fluids, preparing for the run, um, as opposed to the running section. Now, we talked about the importance of, of air temperature and humidity. Now, this is how we're going to measure it. So there's a red bulb globe temperature. Um, these measure four environmental conditions. So you actually have one on UNLV. Um, it's back behind MPE, heading over towards the elementary school. Um, but it measures wind speed, humidity, air temperature, and radiant energy load. So the amount of heat that's possibly being transferred from the sun, right? So the dry bulb is the air temperature and the wet bulb covered by a wick soaked in water. Um, and this is how, uh, so the difference between the dry and wet indicates the level of humidity. And remember, humidity is an indicator of how easily the sweat evaporates from your system. If you're running down in New Orleans in April, that humidity is so high that you are not losing very much to evaporation. So you're going to be spending, if you watch the Ironman at all, there's numerous portions where they have um, sponges soaked in ice water. Or they are, the majority of the time people were grabbing water, they were dousing themselves with it. They weren't drinking it. They were throwing it on their, on their, body, to, on their body to reduce that core temperature. Um, so these are mechanisms that in, in humid environments, because you're not losing that heat, um, through sweat and evaporation, then you need to use some other cooling mechanisms, ice. Um, and if you think back to one of those pictures I showed you of the bad water where that lady had the cooling packs wrapped around her, that's another way to, 
to reduce your core and your skin temperature, right? So she had it in an area that's doing more towards the core, up on the shoulders, um, down around through the chest, um, and then you can also do it on the extremities as well. Um, so now we're going to talk about some environmental hazards. Um, you go through the heat stroke, exhaustion, cramps, hypothermia, and frostbite, right? And I, I mentioned on this before about the Las Vegas Marathon and frostbite. Um, and what ended up happening, so the Vegas Marathon used to be in December, and they've actually moved it up a month now in November because December was just way, way, way too cold. Um, and it used to be in the mornings, not at nighttime. Uh, and now it's at nighttime, so it's it's not as cold as it used to be. Um, but one of the last marathons I did is it was early in the morning and the, and the temperatures were in the low thirties. Um, so it was pretty cold, um, especially for me, I'm from Southern California in Vegas, so I'm not used to cold weather. Um, but so what ended up happening actually might've been in the, in the, in the high thirties, low forties. Um, but so what I had, it was wearing was long sleeves, um, long pants. Um, and then I had gloves on. Now the challenge was. It wasn't rainy, so none of my gear was um, suited for um, the water or temp temperatures. But as you go to the aid stations, you walk through and you grab your water. So I walked through with my gloves on, I'd grab water, and I would attempt to drink some water at these aid stations. Now what would happen? Well, the water, because running and walking, would not simply just go in my system, it would actually go on my hands, right? So at about mile 20, I could no longer open up my fingers and my hands. My hands were now curled because they were so freezing cold. And so at this point, um, I became very close in, in my mind and, and I was worried about frostbite. So I had to take my gloves off um, and, and start to warm up my hands throughout the race. Um, but it was, it was kind of interesting. And, and this is not something that you think about when you think about Las Vegas, right? Coming to Las Vegas, you don't think about the cold. You always think about the hot. Um, in, in environment. So if I, next time you, I'm always going to be looking at what the race temperature is in I, and I will buy clothing that best suits it. So maybe if I did gloves next time, I'd do some waterproof gloves as opposed to just non, just regular running gloves. So this now section is, is one of the sections I want you guys to pay attention to. And I want you guys to come to class ready to discuss. I'm going to post a, a article that talks a little bit more about, um, some of these individual ones, some meta-analysis, and I really want you guys to, to spend some time reading it. Um, and then there's going to be some other um, heat stroke and type things I'm going to put up there. Um, but this is the area that I, that I want to have some fun talking about in class um, um, because the athletic trainers in class might have some ideas of, of this a little bit more than general. Um, and there's some controversies on what Noakes says about some of these things as well. But let's start by talking about heat stroke, right? So heat stroke is, is considered to be uncommon in marathons and it's more common in the shorter distances. And so why is this, why and how is this possible? Well, heat stroke is, is um, caused by a high metabolic rate. So it's a product of running speed and the athlete's mass, right? So generally your sprinters and your faster runners for your 5Ks or 10Ks, um, those aren't gonna be as thin and skinny, less mass as, as your marathon runners, but also they're not running at the speed of which those guys are. So this occurs with a rectal body temperature of greater than 41 C's. Um, and then with within 40 hours, 48 hours of confirmation from enzymes released in the bloodstream as a result of heat damage. So this is where, um, you know, your athletic trainer or your medical aid station will say, I think this person has heat stroke. And they can confirm that within 48 hours if they take a blood sample. Uh, so some of the mental functioning deficits that that occurs some unconsciousness, reduced level of consciousness. So this is that stupor or coma, um, some mental stimulation. So irritability, aggression, convolutions. Um, I'm, I'm generally always irritable or, or aggressive after a run, not aggressive, but definitely irritable. Um, so a little bit more about heat stroke. Um, so the diagnosis, they, they look for a rapid pulse. Um, it's rapid and obvious breathing and then you have your rectal temperature. So some of the factors that are related to environmental conditions so that you don't have that ability um, to um, reduce the body heat through evaporation and sweat because of a temperature um, which affects convection, uh, but also the ability that your sweat is dripping and not coming off the body, the cooling mechanism of a humid environment. 
the speed at which you run so as you run faster or a greater intensity of your vo2 max um, and then some athletes just have a predisposition i am very inefficient at reducing my heat whenever i run i generally run without any clothes because i'm trying to get my skin surface area open as much as possible um, i do not run with hats or skulls um, i will if it's cold out because i want to keep the heat in um, but anytime it's not cold I will be trying to allow heat to evaporate through my head as well. Uh, treatment, you know, lower body temperature, get it down as quick as possible. I fast the torso. Um, the torso. Now, again, this is going to be one of those areas that I would love to talk to some of the athletic trainers and see if they're still doing this because this is a, some of the controversial areas. But the goal is to get that um, body down cool as fast as you can, right? Shivering indicates uh, body temperature has reached that 30 degrees Celsius. Consciousness is regained once you get back up uh, to, or back down to 39 degrees. Um, and then this release is expected to be within 60 to 90 minutes following return to normal. So other heat-related ideas are, are heat cramps. Now, um, these are some ideas with Nick's. Noakes points out, but the theory is it's caused by severe dehydration um, and large sodium chloride losses. And then there's excess of water comp consumption during exercise which dilutes the concentration of blood um, now keep in mind that these heat cramps aren't necessarily stitches um, stitches are or maybe something completely different than the heat cramps um, then heat exhaustion um, dehydration induced heat retention insufficient to cause heat stroke and then sudden cessation of exercise induces a rapid blood drop now this is something we'll talk about too in, in, in um, Noakes kind of controversial talks about there not really being a difference in these, but um, this would be something we talk about in class. So preventing these heat impaired performances, um, ad libitum fluid intake. Um, this is taking in fluids when you feel you want to take in fluids, not on a, on a schedule, um, but when you feel thirsty, you take in a fluid. Um, and then sponging the body. And you see this a lot if you watch the um, Iron Man um, ice cold sponges and just squeeze the water over it. Now to calculate your sweat rate, um, it's important to take your weight before and then you weigh yourself afterwards. And then you have to keep in mind the fluids that you ingest. Now this is tough for running because oftentimes you're squeezing fluids and you're not ingesting them all. A lot of times you're going to spit it out or you're going to try to take fluids in and, and you lose it but you got to do it on one of these experiences where you can control this a little bit more but so the sweat rate in liters per hour is is the difference so it's you take the weight before the weight after and you add in the fluids you've taken and you multiply it times 100 and divide it by the weight before so now we talk about the cold hazards and what happened to me in the Vegas marathon and that's hypothermia right so this is more common in your longer races in northern in the northern hemisphere um, your shorter races have a higher metabolic rate which keeps your heat up a little bit more um, so you don't generally have these instances um, some of the factors clothing and bodily fluids environmental conditions and running speed um, runners your heavier runners have an advantage to this because they produce more body heat and they have more uh, muscle mass that's going to create more um, heat within them so it's easier for them to avoid this now there is a perfect storm and that is a lean marathoner they have light muscle they're lightly clothed and they fatigue to an extent needing to walk for a long period of time so um, if this happens, then they are susceptible to hypothermia through a run, right? So if I'm going out for a long run and I get fatigued, I stop and I walk. Well, now my muscles are no longer working at a, at a rate that's producing a high amount of energy or heat. Um, so I'm more susceptible to this. Um, and then, you know, of course, you have frostbite where things are, are frozen um, and they just stop working. So that is um, our talk for today. Um, so what I want you guys to do is just go ahead and prepare for a class. I'm going to put up a couple papers um, that I that I really want us to read, um, and I want to discuss. Um, one of the ideas too is I want to discuss the idea on whether heat exhaustion um, and heat cramps are are a thing, or 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 is it just right to heat stroke? And or what happens more is that um, this continuum concept is it a continuum or is it not a continuum? 
can you have one and it doesn't progress or in order to get heat stroke do you have to have the other two before you get heat stroke cool all right guys bye